and welcome to the Westminster Institute. I'm Robert Riley, its director. I'm happy today to welcome back an old friend of the Westminster Institute with whom we've done other programs on the Middle East and Iraq, and that is Hassan Nemna. He's a principal at Middle East Alternatives in Washington, DC, and a political analyst who appears daily in the Arab media. He's a contributing editor at FICRA Forum at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. He was previously senior transatlantic fellow at the German Marshall Fund of the United States, senior fellow at the Hudson Institute, visiting fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, and director of the Center for Global Engagement at the Institute for American Values. Between 1999 and 2008, Hassan Nemna assumed leading functions at the Iraq Memory Foundation, the Iraq Foundation, and the Iraq Research and Documentation Project. He specializes in the affairs of the Middle East, North Africa, and the wider Islamic world, with a particular emphasis on radicalism and factionalism. In previous capacities, He's focused on the significance of socio-political and cultural developments in the Middle East region and assessed civic reaction to radicalizing tendencies in Muslim societies. He's written in English, Arabic, and French on political, cultural, historical, and intellectual questions concerning the Arab and Muslim worlds. Today, Hassan is going to discuss Kadami's Iraq, an interlude of false hope, or the dawn of a new era. Thank you, Hassan, for joining us. That's uh, quite a question that you have chosen as the topic for today's discussion. Thank you so much, Bob, and thank you for the Westminster Institute. It's always a pleasure to participate in your thoughtful, always important topics. What uh, I'd like to cover today is where Iraq stands at this moment. It is actually what we're facing is two major events that may or may not shape up as we expect them will take place in Iraq sometime in the coming months. One is the scheduled withdrawal of US combat forces from Iraq by the end of the year. And two is the selection of a new prime minister in light of the results of the elections that happened in October. These two events that normally in any, uh, I would say setting that appears to follow the proper uh, expectations should not be a, a trouble. However, in the case of Iraq, we face a different situation. Let's start with the uh, withdrawal of uh, the US combat uh, forces. Now here we have a situation in which the transition from one administration to the other has allowed forces within Iraq that are not the forces of government naturally, but forces that are proxy power, proxy agencies for Iran to try to reassert themselves. I mean, we, ha we have to underline here Remember, remembering the context. If I may, I would like very quickly to establish the context in order to see what is at stake. What we have in the region is an Iranian expansion project that is in full swing. Again, from the point of view of Iran, it's just resistance against what appears to the Iranian leadership uh, to be an attempt on the part of the US, its partners and its allies to besiege Iran. But actually, even objectively, one can see that Iran is not really besieged. What Iran has done has completely subverted the political and social, social and economic processes in at least four neighboring countries to its west. Actually, we can point to a few to its east too, but that's beyond the scope here. We're talking about Lebanon, which is in a state of disaster. Syria, in which Iran has supported the, the regime and has enabled the regime together with a far bigger contribution from Russia to survive. Iraq, where it has, which is the grand prize from an Iranian point of view, but where it has not succeeded in completely uh, owning the place. And Yemen, 
where it has capitalized on genuine local issues in order to cause trouble to Saudi Arabia and to make of Yemen actually a pawn in its regional project. The reason we can term it to be a regional project because Iran's approach of choice is not to engage governments, although in the case of Syria, the government being a tyrannical, despotic one, it seems to have had no problem engaging the government at the expense of the people. But elsewhere, Iran engages para-national forces, sub-national forces, it creates its own proxies, it creates its own agencies, it allies itself with whoever has a grievance of some sort, typically capitalizing on affinities such as in particular religious affinities, uh, Shia groups in particular, but not solely. For example, in the case of Hamas, Hamas is not Shia and Iran has nonetheless been able to uh, effectively insert itself into the already thorny, already complex, already difficult Palestinian-Israeli situation in order to make it even more difficult to the advantage of Iran. In the case of Iraq, Iraq, as I mentioned, is from an Iranian point of view, is the grand prize. Meaning if Iran could control Iraq and lose all the others, it's fine with Tehran. It's not, uh, I mean, the project of expansion can continue later on, but the important thing is to be able to assert itself in Iraq. And it seemed to be able to do that, really, after the fall of uh, the, the despotic regime of Saddam Hussein. It seems to be able to do that largely as a result of US errors, plenty of errors in the course of uh, the occupation and the withdrawal. But however, due to multiple factors, some of which are intrinsic to Iraq, which has, which has a national identity, which has national forces that are not exactly willing subjects of Iran, but also to Iranian limitations and to support from elsewhere, Iraq has not been absorbed into the Iranian, the new Iranian empire, uh, an empire of a hidden character of some sort. It has not been absorbed, but it nonetheless, Iran has multiple, multiple tracks of influence, multiple tracks of actually subversion within Iraq. What seems to have been the case is that uh, with the Trump administration, with the hardline approach of the Trump administration, Iran was effectively rattled. And the, the killing of Qasem Soleimani and some of the Hashd leaders actually pushed Iran to uh, a little bit of, uh, uh, if you'd like, stop, stop loss measures, including allowing the, the selection of uh, Mustafa al Qadimi as prime minister. Mustafa al Qadimi is definitely not Iran's first choice. Mustafa is a liberal. Mustafa is Western oriented. Much more important, Mustafa is a patriot. Mustafa, Mustafa al Qadimi puts the interest of Iraq first, and therefore he's not exactly the profile that Iran seeks. Nonetheless, from the Iranian perspective, given what seemed to be at that point a determination on the part of the Trump administration to force ahead, it seem to have been a kind of a, a good measure, a good step from Iran to allow Mustafa to be prime minister because Mustafa would like to have. Mustafa al-Qadimi is someone who seeks the type of relationship with Iran that is peer-to-peer -peer, but that is neighborly. There's no antagonism here in principle vis-a-vis -vis Iran. There's antagonism towards anything that Iran does in order to subvert, to upend uh, Iraqi democracy but not uh, uh, one of, if you'd like, an existential niche. So many of the elements, many of the tools that Iran had developed in Iraq had to be, in fact, almost coerced by Iran to accept the choice of Qadim. We're talking particularly here about multiple factions, multiple militias that uh, Iran had to convince by diktat, actually, that, okay, you will have to accept Mustafa al-Qadim, you know, because we like him, but because he's the best choice right now, given the situation that is difficult for us. Now, what has happened since is, uh, in a sense, Mustafa al-Qadimi called the bluff of Iran and acted as a patriot, not as uh, basically someone who serves Iranian interest. He tried hard and actually gave hope to many in Iraq to assert, to show that politics in Iraq can be other than corruption and subservience. This is up until Mustafa al-Qadimi, one can look 
at the various uh, um, heads of state, heads of government in Iraq as having fallen into one or the other, either subserv subservience to Iran or basically corruption in order to uh, enrich the, 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 the acolytes and the cronies who enabled the, the prime minister to get to power, or actually both. In many cases, it was both. But in any case, here, I'm, maybe I'm a little being a little bit unfair, a little generalizing, because some prime ministers have tried to do the right thing, but typically failed. In the case of Mustafa, what we have, Mustafa came to the, the, the position of prime minister at a time where Iraq had witnessed a major protests that uh, effectively changed the nature of the discussion in the country away from identity politics into what can be termed either as generational politics of some sort, or basically uh, uh, po the politics, normal politics of people seeking the betterment of their lives, that of, the, of their children and that of their country altogether. So a rationalization of politics of some sort with limitations. Actually, we need to talk about these limitations later on. But Mustafa came in. He did not, he did his best to embrace the uh, feasible and positive aspects of this movement, but was not exactly um, uh, completely identical in his approach to the demands. And here, as a digression that might be of importance, it's, it's uh, really crucial to understand that for many of the protesters, the, the protesters in Iraq were still operating, I'm talking even about the young, from the perspective that they had been raised to expect that of an entitlement and not that of an opportunity. Along the lines that uh, young people having finished their university uh, studies expected to be hired into the state agencies, the state departments, and therefore many of the protests demanded employment. They did not demand opportunities in order to create employment. They demanded employment. And this is a, a, not exactly something that any state on earth today, definitely not Iraq, is in a position to offer en masse. This a socialist fiction that some in the Arab world had entertained in the past is not tenable. So clearly, Mustafa al-Kadhimi operated in a certain sense to, to address, to engage, to uh, negotiate with the protesters, but he was not their candidate and his vision did not coincide with theirs completely. Nonetheless, he was tasked and he delivered uh, free and fair elections, and he tasked himself, and he delivered national politics. These are the two main, if you'd like, uh, in, uh, results, achievements of uh, the Mustafa al-Kadhimi era. And these two results point to something very important. If they were to continue with Mustafa al-Kadhimi or without Mustafa al-Kadhimi, it does not matter. But the, the, the notion of national politics and free and fair elections. National politics, which means basically arguments that are debated back and forth as a function of the national interest and not of the diktat or the influence of outside powers. That's one major achievement. And the second, free and fair elections that irrespective where the political uh, division, where the political distribution stands, the elections come to ratify or to change or to question or to hold accountable the political class. In a certain sense, if we are to think about a Kadimi formula, this is it. It is national politics, free and fair elections. Now, will Kadimi be prime minister? Chances are he won't. It's not impossible in the context of uh, Iraq for him to be rechosen if months pass and the various uh, political parties are unable to choose uh, a new prime minister well, they might default back on him. That, in my opinion, uh, a biased opinion, I have to say, because I know the man and I think he's really devoted to his mission as uh, basically a public servant in Iraq. And this is actually, even this is kind of a novelty in a place where prime ministership and presidencies are assumed to be positions of prestige and of power and uh, of basically privilege, as opposed to being the privilege of being a public servant which uh, Mustafa Al-Kadhimi is indeed. But whether Mustafa is there or not, we have had in Iraq the model over the past two years with considerable side achievements of this uh, combination 
of national politics and free and fair elections. I have to point in here, for example, to the fact that Mustafa understood, like many in the region and beyond, understand that uh, Iraq in its geostrategic position can either be a battlefield for various powers, regional and international, or a buffer and a force for good, for change, if you'd like, towards uh, limiting the, the conflict, de-escalating, and, and ultimately maybe even finding solutions. Clearly, I mean, when we talk about national politics, it, it goes without saying that the choice here is not to let your country be a battlefield. And this is something, again, I mean, that the regional conference in which the French president participated is a good example of that. Iran participated, Saudi Arabia participated, and both countries, which are one binary in the region that continues to cause trouble along the lines, I mean, the conflict between the two is the source of many troubles in the regions. Both of them participated and held subsequently multiple meetings in Iraq in order to find some common ground somewhere. Again, under Iraqi auspices, with the whole notion that Iraq will not be the battlefield, Iraq will be the buffer, Iraq will be the medium for resolution. So this is where we are. We have a formula, uh, imperfect, absolutely. Has Mustafa Qadimi been a perfect prime minister? Not at all, no one can be. But has he provided the kind of new approach that shows that a different kind of politics can be played, can be engaged in? Yes, he has a focus on Iraq and a focus on elections being truly not a way to rubber stamp power, but a way to check power, in other words, to restore sovereignty where sovereignty is supposed to be in uh, the, the electorate, in the people, in the citizenry. I have to underline here that uh, I would say that uh, the action of President Trump, of the previous administration, of um, uh, killing Qasem Soleimani and some of the Hash leaders might have uh, spooked, might have surprised, and might have actually raised objections among many, me included. Nonetheless, I concede that that action has enabled that space for Mustafa Qadimi to uh, effectively to try this experience. And therefore, irrespective of whether that was planned or not, and I do not think it was planned, but uh, here we have a situation in which we ought to recognize that uh, the uh, Mustafa Academy would not have been prime minister and would not have had the chance of showing that his formula can be applied with a, with a measurable success had it not been for the uh, situation that was created with, with the assassination, with the killing of uh, Hassan Soleimani. I have to point here too, just in order not to end on this note of uh, uh, praise for the past administration, that the, uh, um, the hashed, those groups in Iraq, the, those factions in Iraq that belong in one way or another, but actually not completely because they are uh, uh, unruly, but belong to, to Iran, are under Iranian influence. We're talking about these militias, these factions that constitute the hashed, are actually copying bit by bit the stop the steal strategy of the Trump camp with regard to the elections by irrespective of how many courts, how many reviews, how many recounts happen in Iraq, they keep on insisting fraud happened and fraud happened at a large scale and therefore this election is effectively null and void. So here we have really maybe two inadvertent effects of American politics on Iraqi politics, but nonetheless two substantial ones and chances are Iraq will not be the last place that sees such effects. But now, keeping the focus on Iraq, Mustafa al-Kadimi provided what amounts to a small model, an experiment, if you'd like, that shows that a different kind of politics is possible. Whether this is going to be carried or ignored is a function of many factors, but I have to underline here, once again, the weight, the value, the importance of the United States. A Biden administration that is lukewarm about supporting democracy in Iraq would seal the fate of Iraq in the direction of effectively wasting this, these achievements and these gains. Uh, Biden administration or whoever comes after Biden who show a commitment, a real uh, interest 
in making this experience succeed will have a long way, will have really a weight in doing so. It is in the best interest of Iraq, the region, stability in the world for Iraq not to be the battlefield that it has been and that we can fear that it might get to be and for Iraq to be indeed the place where uh, people and countries in disagreement can meet, can talk, and under Iraqi auspices can find solutions. Tell me, Hassan, how would that support from the United States express itself? Already, uh, Mustafa Kadimi was in the, in the United States and engaged in conversations of a strategic nature about uh, effectively rationalizing, normalizing the relationship with the United States. However, uh, one has to, to realize that even that conversation uh, lacked uh, the clarity and lacked uh, ultimately the, the real results that were anticipated. Now we are at a, at a point where uh, the talk is by the end of this year, by the 31st of December, combat troops will withdraw, advisors and trainers will remain in there. It is important for that not to be token. This is where the, the issue is, is crucial. It's important that when we're talking about advising and training, the idea is not to repeat, and lots of people are hoping and lots of people are fearing that uh, what uh, the Biden administration has committed in Afghanistan will be done again in, uh, in Iraq. So it's important to underline the fact that this is, Afghanistan was also a crucially important place, but whether uh, irrespective of how we assess it, the deed is done. In the case of Iraq, it is not, it is crucial for American interests, for US interests, for the stability of the region, for, stability, for the stability of Iraq, not to abandon Iraq. And therefore, when we, when we scale back our presence from combat to advising and training, for it to be genuinely and substan substantively so, and not merely a way of uh, basically uh, uh, turning the page, unfortunately, like the Obama administration had done at one point and caused a major setback in, the, in, in uh, the, the, un, the unfolding of events in Iraq. Let's underline that this successful experiment with uh, Mustafa Qadimi, pa partly successful, I'm not here claiming stellar success, but we're talking about this counter model, is many years delayed because once again of US abandonment in a certain sense. So let's hope that the Biden administration will learn from the mistakes of the previous, of, of the Obama administration and would capitalize on the, whether deliberate or inadvertent, the, the, on the, what uh, the Trump administration has enabled in Iraq in order to show that American resolve is there, is adamant, is continuous, and therefore will not allow uh, Iraq that is heading in the right direction to slide back into chaos to the, to the detriment of everyone. Let me just ask a quick question that's not directly so much on the points you have been making, but since you invited the comparison with Afghanistan, I have to ask you this. Um, as, as many suspected, and as I myself uh, was one of those, the Afghan National Army simply melted away. Uh, it, it's, um, it didn't have a sufficient uh, feeling of legitimacy uh, to cohere as a national army, and they just went back to their, their tribal regions and home. Uh, after all of the investment and um, training that was given by uh, US and uh, allied forces. Now, Iraq is a very different country, even though it has a uh, still a strong tribal component. And if the United States is remaining to train uh, military forces, do you have any sense of the condition in which the Iraqi military is today? Is it too infiltrated and beholden to Iran? Or does it share the sense of nationalism that uh, Mustafa Khadami has? Well, you will not be surprised if I tell you it's a little bit of both. But let's, let's underline the fact here 
that the meltdown that happened in the case of Afghanistan is not the fault of the soldiers or the officers or the, 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 the rank and file of the Afghan army. Yes, the, the, the tribal component is there. Had the Afghan leadership uh, given an alternative to those uh, young men and older men uh, to, to stay and fight for their nation, for their society, for their future, I would suspect that maybe not all of them, maybe, maybe a plurality, maybe a majority would do so. Unfortunately, in the case of Afghanistan, it's our failure to recognize that while we were training the army, we were allowing a regime that was built on corruption to basically dominate. And therefore, no, a soldier will not give his life and deprive his family of his responsibility towards them just to enable a corrupt politician to steal more and run away. This is what happened in Afghanistan. In the case of Iraq, it's not simple. Something similar did happen in Iraq. Let's not forget. It was a band of a few hundreds, maybe a couple of thousand at the most, fighters from the so-called Islamic State that attacked an army that we had trained, equipped, provided weaponry, provided, uh, if you'd like, a doctrine of engagement, etc., in Mosul and in much of Iraq, and the army evaporated. Because at that point, once again, Maybe actually in that case, we were not as serious in terms of training the, uh, the Iraqi army because I know for a fact that many of those who were supposedly being trained were just names on a sheet of paper and the money was siphoned away for, for other purposes. Again, I mean, this is a problem endemic. Uh, the, the problem of corruption is endemic. But at that point, there was no leadership that framed the fight and framed the national army as one that is protective of its nation. In fact, in Mosul and in quite, quite a large uh, fraction of Iraq at that point, the Iraqi army was viewed almost as an occupation army because uh, uh, basically soldiers and officers from elsewhere are brought in with their communitarian biases and they do abuse and they're not interested in service. They're simply interested in siphoning away whatever resources are available. That experience we've witnessed Let's not forget that Mustafa al-Qadimi, despite the fact that he comes, I mean, his background is not military, but he was head of a security service, the, the intelligence service, and he was one of many, was not the only one, many leaders of such services that were warning of such an outcome and had taken measures against such an outcome. But what, uh, what these, uh, this very brief period of Mustafa al-Qadimi as a prime minister has demonstrated to the, for, for the army and for all those services, talking about the, the security and military services, is that if you are put in uh, harm's way, it is not for politicians to get away with loot. It's in order for your nation to proceed. And therefore, does that mean that uh, all the military is now in line with such a vision? Absolutely not. But it is positively not Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, there was no such core. And the proof is, even before we were out, they were out talking about the politicians with their loot and with their God knows what else. So in, in the case of Iraq, what we have here is we have a proof of concept. What the, the Mustafa al-Qadimi short prime ministership was, was a proof of concept that the nation of Iraq, which has a solid identity that transcends factionalism, that transcends communitarianism, that transcends the, the uh, religious sectarian identities and ethnic identities, that nation can be reestablished, can be reset on a course towards being a functioning state, a functioning democracy. It, the, the proof of concept has been uh, provided. It is now up to the next prime minister next to the next political elite, actually, to uh, carry through and push through. The security and uh, forces and the army might suffer uh, quite a bit of uh, attrition as a result of infiltration that is attempted, no question. But uh, this infiltration is not to the point where Iran owns the, the armed forces. Otherwise, they would not have the need to cater to those warlords 
and many of them are gangster-like warlords that Iran nurtures in Iraq in order to balance the security forces that are more regular. If we can, Hassan, let's go back to the election. Mustafa Hadami promised early elections and he kept his promise. Mm -hmm. And I believe this was the sixth election in Iraq, uh, parliamentary election since 2003. And the foreign observers were impressed by the integrity and the fairness of the process, despite the fact that you mentioned that a number of disgruntled parties have brought suits. However, only 41% of the Iraqi electorate participated. What does that tell you? Well, it's 41%. It is not... Uh the low single digits or 10% and 12% in Afghanistan. And that should tell you something. The fact of the matter, we are uh, not across the Middle East. And actually I would say this is a global phenomenon. There's a certain um, attitude of suspicion vis-a-vis -vis political systems. We have a broken trust between electorate and uh, political systems, electorates and political I shouldn't call them classes except in some cases, but basically anyone who engages in politics. This is an endemic problem that has become even more acute as a result of social media because it enables those malign uh, actors that would like to amplify, to uh, uh, effectively make a problem that exists an even worse problem, not limiting themselves to misinformation engaging in disinformation, in malinformation, it enables them to, to be active and they are active. In addition to the fact one has to recognize that Iraq, which has lived under dictatorships for so long, has had to be weaned out of the, the patriarchal state, out of paternalism, into assimilating gradually the notion of the citizen sovereign, that sovereignty and uh, the right Basically, rule is ruled by the citizens with delegation to the political uh, elected uh, members of government and not basically an entitled class that rules. And no one can claim that this process is complete, that this process has uh, reached where it should be. This is why we cannot talk today about Iraqi democracy. We can talk about actions and movements on the path to democracy in Iraq and uh, again, this is the, the, the force, this is the power the, 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 of uh, the Mustafa Qadimi experience because it's one in which that basically shows that the degeneration that has happened in the course of uh, close to two decades since uh, the fall of Saddam is not organic. It is not something that is built into Iraqi society. It's the artifact of basically uh, uh, wrong models and wrong uh, and uh, faulty approaches that have been applied. And with the right approach, improvements can happen. And the vector of progress is what matters in here. And what, when, I, when we're talking about proof of concept, we're talking about a major vector of progress in that direction. So the, the more we get delivery, the more we get participation. I mean, after a while, we all know from how it, it happens in the West, once you have enough delivery, the participation retreats because people are satisfied and therefore less incentivized to participate. But we're not there in Iraq. We are in, 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 a, in a place where you have a new generation that says the politics of the past two decades are obsolete. We want new politics. What Mustafa Qadimi has provided is not exactly what they want, but really it's actually, it's important here to see it more as a, a discussion, a negotiation, between this new generation with what it wants and what it is used to and what the new model has offered and what the new model can offer and how it can change and how basically a meeting can happen. Irrespective of who's at the helm, really, this is not a, a matter, this is, Mustafa Qadimi has presented himself throughout as uh, selfless in his uh, um, action in, in his actions in Iraq. He, whether you, one accepts that or not does not matter. Whether Mustafa Qazimi stays on board or not does not matter. What matters is we have a good model. Well, let's look at the complexion of things as the result of these elections. As you know, Muqtata al-Sadr uh, gained the largest number of uh, seats, 70 or so. 
is he the kingmaker? And if so, whom would he crown? Well, whom he, who do he, he would he crown? I wouldn't even uh, try to guess for two reasons. A, this is a political game that is with the, with the cards hidden for, for the months to come. We're going to talk because on his own, he's unable. He, he needs to create the kind of coalition that uh, can, can allow some sort of a, a, of a choice. But I mean, there's, there's another reason beyond, if you'd like, this rational political reason that makes me, in the case of Muqtada Sadr, say, let's not try to anticipate here any action. Muqtada Sadr and the Sadrist movement is one of those ambiguous political phenomena in Iraq today. Is he an Iranian asset or not? I, I've, talked to, I've talked to people who will, will promise you that he is absolutely an Iranian asset, albeit one that is activated in different ways from the uh, various militias. Others will tell you not at all. He's the expression of Iraqi patriotism to everything in between including his visits to Saudi Arabia, including his uh, um, typically, uh, I mean, his signature style of being utterly incoherent. No, in being incoherent, he, he's, he's not showing you, he's not trying to distract you. He seems to be himself distracted throughout. So, I mean, again, here we have, uh, uh, he uh, survives on the glow of his father was one of the most important religious figures in Iraqi history and maybe in Shia history in the 20th century for sure. Uh, and his father, who uh, tried to uh, basically uh, protect the community, the Shia community, against uh, a Ba'ati regime that was adamant at trying to, to disintegrate any structure that does not belong, belong to it, you see. Uh, a la totalitarianism that we, we had seen in the Soviet Union and elsewhere, um, uh, has succeeded in creating this kind of allegiance to his lineage, to Muqtada Sadr. And uh, uh, really to, to think of the merits of uh, the man, I mean, the, he has not exactly achieved much, uh, much at all. He has not uh, been consistent at all, but he's now, whether we like it or not, indeed, as you put it, uh, Bob, the kingmaker. And what about the other factions, uh, the Fatah group, and uh, is, is it all way too fluid now to think of how a majority might congeal and uh, behind whom they might do it? I do think so, but they're engaging in a game that is a little bit risky. Actually, not a little bit, a lot risky, quite a bit risky, which is having lost, all of them have lost, I mean, considerable number of seats. So they're trying to leverage the utterly fictional claims of uh, the militias, that uh, basically there has been widespread fraud and there has been uh, a conspiracy to eliminate them, etc. They're trying to leverage those claims in order to reach a compromise, quote unquote, that would enable them to gain a little bit more in order to have more leverage. The, uh, the, the, really the risks here are to, uh, to undo one of the two major achievements of what we can term the Mustafa Kadimi episode, which is delivering free and fair elections. Because if you engage in any sort of compromise, uh, having had an electoral commission that is independent, having had a court system that, that, that is transparent and has seen that no, there has not been the type of fraud that you're claiming at all, Having had all of that, if you allow any kind of compromise, it's signaling to the population that their cynicism prior to this episode is the way to go. The cynicism vis-a-vis -vis a democratic process that has always been, since the times of Saddam and before Saddam, it has always been a way for those in power to simply claim more power. Not, uh, it was never a question of uh, measuring what the, what the people think of those in power. It was always trying to get more endorsement, whether uh, uh, actually it's never real. Because in the case of Saddam, I think in one case, he indeed got 100% of the vote, not one dissenter in the whole country. But uh, irrespective, even if you do it differently, meaning in a less crass way, if you, if you bypass the technical verdict, 
that these have been free and fair elections, you basically invite the Iraqi public not to be trusting of the political, of, of the electoral process. And therefore this building block of democracy, the, the, the foundational building block of democracy is uh, exposed and uh, therefore is uh, really, it's undoing the positive of this, this previous period. Well, as the uh, parliamentary wrangling begins over the composition of the new government, um, Mustafa Khatami will remain as prime minister, as a caretaker. But as we know from <laughs> yeah. pre pre previous episodes, that could last for a considerable period of time. And might that eventually incline them to accept him for another term? That's not impossible, actually. But I wouldn't count on it. I wouldn't bank on it for the simple reason that uh, while uh, Mustafa al Qadimi has set a course for a new type of uh, application, a new type of delivery in government, one that fights corruption, one that seeks the public interest, one that is both proactive and corrective. We've seen him rush to situations where that, that had gotten out of control in order to fix them. And we've seen him plan in order to avoid having such situations happen. This is a model which actually, let's, I mean, while giving him all the credit that is due to him, that's what a politician is supposed to do. That's what a prime minister is supposed to do. And therefore, he, we're not talking here about a super, super, superman. We're talking simply about someone who took his job seriously and did what he's supposed to do. While, uh, while uh, across the political spectrum, you have many people who had promised themselves prior to Mustafa al Qadimi becoming prime minister, promised themselves their turn in that uh, position, not just of prestige, but of loot, of plunder, and have every intent of finding a way back, whether directly, personally, or whether through someone who would be a facade and enables them to, to, to go back to that means. So here we're, we're, we're talking once again, meaning when you, when you, even if you have free and fair elections, that you elect whoever is uh, potentially uh, a candidate. And uh, you, when you have a saturation level, candidates who represent these interests, we're not talking about a revolution. We're talking about a gradual evolution that will require someone of the caliber of Mustafa al Qadimi to come, meaning someone of the caliber of Mustafa al Qadimi. I'm simply referring here to a public servant, someone who thinks of themselves as a public servant and to continue the work enough time in order to create that core of an Iraqi state that is resistant to corruption and that ultimately will end up generating the type of leadership that uh, we, would, we would like to see. But for the time being, I would say, I do not consider it to be a high probability that uh, they'll settle on him, but if they get to an impasse and if, I mean, ultimately, if no one of them, if, if everyone is convinced that they themselves have no chance, they might want to make sure that the others do not have a chance at loot either. And in that case, it's Mustafa. Is it uh, the former Prime Minister Maliki who might return? Maliki definitely is uh, actually offering himself yeah. as uh, the alternative and on actually uh, using the type of language that still has resonance with some sectors who belong to the militias, but actually is repulsive to many others, because the idea here is that uh, Mustafa is an agent of the West, Mustafa is an enabler of the Americans. For most of the population in Iraq today, first of all, that's not exactly an insult or an accusation. And second, they see that that's not the case. I mean, Mustafa did not create enmity with Iran. Actually, he had very cordial relations with Iran, but he insisted on a peer-to-peer -peer relationship with Iran, did not always get it, but actually this was the push, this was the drive, while at the same time insisted on a peer-to-peer -peer relationship with the US. Here again, I mean, this is something, the, the, he is uh, basically, this is what I said, when I, when I refer to, he has given the model of national politics, it means the national interest first, it means Iraq first. We might add peer-to-peer -peer with the Pope. 
<laughs> well, no one is on a peer-to-peer -peer basis with the Pope. I mean, that's... Uh, no, it's, it's, I'm joking, of course, but that very successful <laughs> visit we, of Pope we, Francis to Iraq, which was quite stunning, really. Absolutely, but this, this is exactly uh, part of the byproducts of having a national government, having national politics that are in place. It encourages those of good faith, and the Pope is the prime example, example of that, of actually seeking, connecting, engaging, and being there. And this is what has happened with the Pope. It happened with a lot of leaders. It happened with a lot of normal people. Again, Iraq all of a sudden, even if it is for those just the few months, the, the, the couple of years where we had, where Mustafa al was there, not as a grand leader, he was no grand leader, he was a public servant, but Iraq in many of its aspects seemed like a normal country. That's the aspiration. It is not grand, it's not a great Iraq, it is not uh, the, the, uh, the, the empire of Iraq, who cares? I mean, what, what matters here, normalcy. And uh, when, when you have politics that are centered on the interests of your constituency, that's normalcy. When you have a system of accountability, that's normalcy. Did, was it achieved in its totality? Absolutely, positively, no. It cannot, you see, but it, it has the course been set? Has the direction been pointed to? Yes. Well, our friend Kanan Makia wrote one of the most singular books about Iraq called Republic of Fear that uh, characterized a society living under state terror as it had lived in that condition on, uh, under Saddam Hussein for, for so many years. That's a hard, very hard thing to come out of. How normal these many years later from uh, 2003, mm -hmm. and, and, and then also going through the terrible Daesh violence and the assassinations and kidnappings and so forth, how, how normal is Iraq today? How normal is the society? The good news is that uh, the majority of Iraqis today have not experienced the kind of uh, systems that were copied and not by accident, copied by design from the Soviet, uh, East German and other systems that had created the Republic of Fear. The Republic of Fear was not um, uh, a Saddam innovation or invention. It was his take on Stalinism, his take on the, the kind of totalitarianism that the communist regimes in Eastern Europe had uh, imposed on their populations. The, the difference is that uh, uh, it was done in, uh, with redundancies to account for the inadequacies of many of the systems and therefore maybe was even more oppressive if such a thing can be believed. The, the current generation has not experienced that. They have a sense of that in the, a lot of the apathy and the dependence that their parents may show towards the political system, the cynicism of their parents toward the political system. They themselves, the, generations, the generation of today, has other reasons to be cynical about and to be uh, really uh, actually uh, uh, resisting of it is that combination, which is actually the two sides of the same coins, of the same coin, terrorism and corruption. Corruption enables terrorism, terrorism enables corruption. They have li lived through it and therefore the previous elections in um, some cases, we do have in Iraq an enlightened religious leadership that has done its best. I'm talking about, about Imam Sistani naturally. Ayatollah Sistani. He has done his best to steer Iraq out of falling into the Iranian trap of a theocracy and at the same time uh, avoiding a fall into anarchy. So he has acted as a guiding light from behind the scene in some uh, pointing towards what is, if you'd like, first steps towards democracy. Again, this is not an ideal arrangement at all. And uh, counting on the goodness of a religious leader in order to uh, shape the way to democracy is definitely not the formula to be applied everywhere. But given the scarcity of elements, of positive elements in Iraq, that was one positive element. And actually, uh, talking about Ayatollah Sistani, his uh, 
actions saved literally hundreds of thousands of people because he has issued fatwas, although he, he tried to avoid having fatwas, but he has issued fatwas in order to avoid the kind of fratricidal wars that happened in, in Iraq. In any case, that's a different uh, issue here, Bob. What matters is that Canaan describes a society that suffers from ills. Uh, the society suffered from the ills under Saddam, not because of the person of Saddam. When we think about uh, Hitler and Nazism, it's not Hitler who set the course for all of Nazism. And yes, I'm comparing the two, because in both cases, we have uh, basically leaders who claim to be uh, the ultimate and claim to provide solutions and end up providing solutions that kill a lot and a lot of people. So uh, the, the fact of the matter, it will remain uh, really an obligation on Iraq, on Middle Eastern societies, at, in, in, in general, on Islamic societies and beyond the Islamic societies, even Christians in the Middle East and others, to review really what makes it possible for such systems and for such uh, leaders to emerge. Is it built just into the economy, into the culture, into the mindset, into the religion? These are longer term discussions. Really what we have been facing is a matter of livelihood, a matter of survival. And this is why I go back to the practical approach of Mustafa al-Qadimi. Again, in Dr. scene, I have not uh, spoken to, with Mustafa al-Qadimi about it at all, but as an observer, I see what he has done is try to fix the problems and anticipate the problems, not of the uh, existential or of the total sense, problems that, that have an immediate effect. We have lost in the past few years, uh, someone in Iraq who has been maligned and who has been uh, actually at times uh, held as a genius at other times as a demon. I'm talking about uh, Ahmad Shalabi. Ahmad Shalabi also had the, the kind of vision and he tried to go beyond, if you'd like, the, the immediate, beyond the even the intermediate into the comprehensive, into uh, thinking of a regional order that would enable Iraq, Iran, Turkey, Syria, others to live in harmony. We're not at this stage. Uh, one has to accept the fact that we are today at the stage that uh, most people would like to make sure, A, that they are safe, B, that they have enough to eat, and C, and probably the most important longer term, they have an opportunity to prosper and to leave for their children something better than they, what they had. Again, everyone shares these concerns, but I would argue that uh, in the paternalistic cultures of the Middle East, especially after a century of grand narratives that try to promote paternalism into a new patriarchy, we have a lot to do in order to basically graduate into the sense of really, and the citizen who has these needs has to, while acting with the collective, but has to be in charge of his own needs and try to seek them and expect of his government uh, to provide the framework, the opportunity for him to deliver and not uh, to provide him with entitlements, basically, with the various entitlements. Well, and job is today still viewed as an entitlement. Hassan, let's take a look at the very rough neighborhood in which uh, Iraq resides. You've spoken of Iraqi-Iranian relations um, and of... Uh, Academy's attempt to keep those peer to peer. I think we both remember back in 2003 that success in Iraq after the invasion had been defined in ways that were inimical to the interests of both uh, Iran and Syria, which would have led anyone who knew the area to expect those countries to massively interfere in the internal affairs of Iraq which they both did without paying a penalty. Can you take us around the region and tell us how things stand for Iraq, country by country, if you want to start in the West, Syria? Sure. Well, well the, there's good news here, is that um, from a purely, if you'd like, objective, rational perspective, Iraq has no real enmity with anyone, maybe except with Turkey on water grounds. Other than that, Iran too, actually. Iran also has 
blocked a lot of the, the, the water resources that flow into Iraq. But, but these are technical issues, and uh, I see no reason why these issues cannot be resolved especially with better water management, etc. I mean, let's, let's keep in mind water security, food security, energy security. These are the real issues going forward. But uh, these are issues that militate towards cooperation between everyone. The problem that uh, Iraq faces today is that there is indeed in the region a project of hegemony that pretends to be a project of resistance. And uh, this, I'm talking about the Iranian project in particular. There are other, uh, if you'd like, lesser projects, such as uh, does uh, Erdogan has uh, some sort of a, of a dream of a neo-Ottoman uh, realm? Maybe, but he really can be discouraged, dissuaded against going that path. Uh, rather, if you'd like, with, with far less effort than trying to wean Iran out of the, uh, empire as a resistance model that it has engaged in. And uh, he, here is the, really the catch. It is to the detriment of Iran itself for this project to continue, because while there is some potential gain in the midterm, such as would, would Iran be able to control Iraq? Maybe if the situation is really uh, gets to be in its favor for some uh, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, astrological uh, configuration, I don't know. But can Iran longer term hold I Iraq? Not at all. So, and uh, uh, can Iran threaten Israel? By all means, it does. Will Iran be able to survive a real confrontation with Israel? Not at all. You see, at least I can promise you, Lebanon will not survive such a confrontation. And uh, Syria will pay the price, Iraq will pay the price, Iran will pay the price. So I mean, the, the fact of the matter, we face a rather, I would say, intricate situation in the region that, uh, objectively speaking, there should be a way to secure the interests of all the countries in a reasonable way, avoiding the excess uh, greed that animates most people. Absolutely true, but nonetheless, uh, and this is not doable because we have still the illusion of an empire being possible on the Iranian side. You use the term, Hassan, empire through uh, resistance. By that, you mean Iran's support for the popular mobilization forces in- Iran is in the business of forging, creating a new Persian empire while pretending to the whole world that it's the champion of resistance movements. Resistance as empire, you see our empire as resistance. Yeah. We but, but it is, what I'm underlining here, this is not tenable. I mean, this is not, it's not, it's not that well they're on the way to success. To success. They're, they're not, okay? And it's not they're on the way to creating a mad situation, mutually assured destruction. They're not, you see. So what they're on the way to, look for every place that they have uh, been able to, to, to prevail, whether it's Lebanon, Syria, Yemen, they're on the way of completely destroying these places and uh, gaining in the process just some temporary lever leverage. So Lebanon is worth some temporary leverage for Iran, Yemen the same, and ultimately these leverages will vanish and Iran, which is already itself suffering. So I mean, the, the, the point is, there is a path once again here, I mean, there, there's a path in the region that includes Israel, that includes Turkey, that includes Iran, all the way to Ethiopia. We're talking about really a region that, that has to have some certain level of integration, there is a way to think of a future that is not based on conflict and that is actually, that satisfies the interests of everyone. No one can claim that uh, while demographic considerations make it impossible. Well, that argument about demographic considerations making it impossible was the argument presented 50 years ago at a time when the the demography was not even a tiny fraction of where we are today and will be presented probably by protagonists 50 years from now with, with uh, looking back at today as being the good, good old times. The fact of the matter, the longer this problem is let to fester, the more intricate, the more difficult the solution, but this is not a problem that is not resolvable. This is uh, the, the issue that needs to be underlined. That means basically that these problems are not ideological they pretend to be ideological. The ideology uh, is there and one cannot discount that for some people, 
I would argue, a minority of people, they are truly ideological. For another fraction of the population, they have an ideological side to them, pride, uh, religion, name it, whatever. And there is a, a concrete aspect to, that, to, to, to it at the same time. But for many, many others, the ideological coating is just the way it is framed to them. Maybe convincing certain days, maybe not convincing at all most of the time. The, the issue here, if we have the kind of courage at the level of leadership that says ideology notwithstanding, we, we are set to be together. We are set to share this region one way or another. No one is going to leave. The, the, the Iranians are here to stay. The, the, the Kraker regime will have to, to reconsider, recalibrate its ideology. If it's indeed what Iran would like to have, uh, a clerical regime, so be it, but not an empire. The empire is not that choice because empire is not about Iran. It's about outside of the borders of Iran. You see, so, so, so the issue here is that it is possible to negotiate, to be reasonable if trust is rebuilt, because let me put it this way. I know for a fact that many supporters of the Iranian project do think of it as being a resistance project because there is that, that uh, uh, what I would consider completely false narrative that, uh, well, there's a neo-imperialist, Zionist, name it whatever you want, that's here to suck the blood of, the, of this region and take its resources. And what I keep on wondering, where are those resources that are to be taken? Are we talking about the oil that's obsolete? Or are we talking about agricultural lands that have been completely de de destroyed? Are we talking about water resources that are no longer there? We need a certain sense of rationalism, but more so we need to start building trust. Can we just touch quickly upon that very dramatic episode from early uh, November when uh, this drone strike on Mustafa al khadami's residence inside the Green Zone was uh, seen clearly as an attempt at assassination? No, no question. Though apparently and, nobody has put forth a claim of credit for it. Well, they do not need to. The tools used are uh, signature tools. We're not talking here about uh, a generic drone that's available in any, in any electronic store all over the world. We're talking about drones that are owned, that are Iranian, uh, that are originate from Iran, and they were handed to a number of militias in Iran. And uh, it's a part and parcel of the malicious kind of uh, atmosphere that promoted by these mil militias. And I have to underline here that does that mean that Iran has tried to kill Khadimi? I do not, uh, I would not necessarily jump to that conclusion because there is a tension between Iran and many of its assets in many of these places. Maybe the one exception is really the relationship between Iran and Hezbollah in Lebanon where the relationship is one of subservience, but where it is completely clear. In the case of Iraq, these militias are obedient 90 plus percent of the time and troublemakers about 10% of the time. Is this part of the 10%? I would tend to think so. Maybe someone somewhere in Iran knew that it would happen and thought it might not be a bad idea to send the signal that we're back, especially the signal would be sent not that much to Kadhimi, but to uh, the Biden administration, that we, you're, not, you're not Trump and we're no longer in fear. So it's, it's that kind of thing. There was another item in the news recently that um, was very sad because it included some uh, Kurds from Northern Iraq who had been taken to the Polish border in the attempts to basically push them over and create a breach that would allow a number of refugees to flood into there and into the EU. And they were turned back and they indeed flown back, uh, I believe to Kurdistan. But we haven't talked about Kurdistan yet. What is the current status of the intra-Iraqi relationships there? It doesn't seem to be quite the flashpoint issue as it used to be in the past. Has something settled down in that respect? Again, it's, uh, it will require a completely different uh, discussion, Bob, but in, in two words, there are affinities between what happens in Kurdistan and what happens, what happens in Erbil and what happens in Baghdad. I'm talking both at the level of government and also at the level 
of uh, the citizenry. And uh, the latest uh, student protests that we've seen in, uh, in Kurdistan are indication of that. We're talking about similar concerns, a similar mood, but we have to recognize the fact that uh, Kurdistan going its own way since the 90s has created two societies that, that have a lot of affinities and that have a lot to share, but nonetheless that have also different dynamics. While Kurdistan today is not on a course to independence, but speaking as someone who has looked into the matter in, in a very close way, in a very detailed way, I would say that uh, the aspiration for independence will remain there and ultimately will happen, hopefully as a friendly uh, kind of separation, re-evaluation of the encounter with Iraq, but this is not the subject of the day. Meaning Kurdistan today is a region of Iraq and uh, the uh, Kurdish politics are going their own metamorphosis from family-based to uh, something else. What is this something else? It's not really, it has not shaped completely. There's a new uh, business class in Kurdistan that's influential. There, there are new connections with all sorts of places globally, but there's also a certain consciousness that is both local and global. So this is, uh, I mean, this is something to watch over the next many years. Well, in referring to Kurdistan having gone its own way since the 90s, by so doing it, it, it turned itself into a pretty normal place. Would you agree? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, again, again, everything, everything has to be placed in context. I mean, definitely. Uh, um, there's a certain Kurdistani pride, and I'm calling it Kurdistani pride and not Kurdish pride, because actually part of how Kurdistan is evolving is recognizing the, 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 the diversity that is in Kurdistan and embracing it. And that's actually something that is, uh, uh, I would say, rather rare in the Middle East. I would, I would expect it to, uh, to, to flourish more because it, it is rare today after a century of reductionism, but it is more reflective of the regional history than one would like, uh, one, that one would assume. Uh, let me close with this uh, sort of reverie. Um, Iraq actually has historical periods which you can look back upon with pride and as a model. We know that in the 1950s, Iraq was the most prosperous, best educated, normal country in the Middle East. It had a European standard of living. I mean, maybe Portuguese, but nonetheless, <laughs> a lot better than its neighbors. No, a normal place. Um, and as you know, a, a, a parliamentary monarchy and um, a, a civil society, independent judiciary, a relatively free press. That, I mean, one would only wish, right, uh, for those things in the places from which they just appeared long ago. Is that just a reverie or is it a, not tomorrow, but in some foreseeable future? I mean, are, are the young people even aware of what Iraq used to be like and that it, it may be able to become again? Let me just underline, Bob, that uh, in the collective memory of uh, Iraqis, Iraq was all of that, but at the same time, it was also something else. There were uh, drastic, dramatic, sometimes tragic differences between urban centers, Baghdad in particular, Mosul and Basra to some extent, and much of what remains of Iraq. So uh, would that model that actually uh, uh, was applied, implemented, uh, was visible in Baghdad, would it be able to be applied elsewhere? Maybe, I mean, the answer from much of the young people today, we do not want any return to any 50s. We want to look at the 2050s, you see. And the 2050s, yes, I mean, the models that people seek are a very localized version of a global civilization. This is, not, this is not looking back, this is looking forward. You are right about the need to never forget because after all, we are 
what we are, in sort of in the sense that we carry with us in our uh, language, in our genes, in our uh, way of life, what our what preceding generations had done, have achieved. But it is also refreshing to see that uh, uh, th th you do have in Iraq evolving today uh, an openness, not just on what, we, what they were, but also where the whole world were. And let me underline that Iraq is maybe the one place on earth that can claim to be really the cradle of civilization. This is where not just uh, kind of in the Middle East, the cradle of, this is the cradle of Western civilization. This is uh, the Sumerian, uh, Akkadian, uh, Assyrian, Babylonian, all of that. This is where our whole history starts. Clearly uh, humans and the human family has lived long before, but we started recording it there. And to a certain extent, we still carry a lot of what was decided then, our, our uh, week, our months, our uh, uh, constellations, uh, all of that is still a carry through from there. So I would, I would hope that the Iraqis recognize their place in time and space in a certain sense and keep on looking forward. One of the worst things about Daesh or ISIS was their actual attempt to destroy the memory and the artifacts of the glorious past those civilizations to which you have just referred. Absolutely. We've gone in the region and beyond, but in the region, we've gone through many instances of total rupture with the past. Okay. I wonder to what extent it is still possible in our world today. You see, there has been times where, let's take it from the example of Egypt, it was possible to kill the educated elite in order to deprive the Egyptians for 2000 years of their whole millenarian heritage. You see, you had to wait to the 19th century for it to be rediscovered. Today, it, it no longer, such ruptures are no longer possible maybe. Uh, uh, the Islamic State is nothing but, uh, uh, let's not give them any credit more than what they were. Terrorists, killers who were defeated and hopefully uh, the society will have to look deep into what made the appeal of such a destructive ideology there for young people and find ways to, to correct it. Great, well, I'm afraid we're out of time today, but I'd like to thank Hassan Nemna for joining me to discuss Mustafa Hadami's Iraq, an interlude of false hope or the dawn of a new era. I invite our viewers to go to the Westminster Institute webpage or visit our YouTube channel where you can find Mustafa's prior uh, lectures for the Westminster Institute, which I would I suggest to you are evergreen, still worth listening to again. And uh, other Westminster talks ranging from China to Russia and other Middle Eastern subjects. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Robert Riley, director of Westminster Institute.